Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the classic two-player game, Backgammon. We don't know who designed Backgammon or exactly when it was first played, but experts think it was about 5,000 years ago. To play, you'll need a backgammon set, and if you end up liking the one I'm using in this video, you'll find an affiliate link in the description below to pick up one of your own. But really, any set will do. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the board between the players so that one is sitting on this side and the other is over here. Each player now collects 15 checkers in one of the two colors. Different sets will have different colors, but normally you'll have a dark and lighter one. I'll play with the brown pieces and my opponent will take the white ones. You'll notice the board is made up of several narrow triangles known as points. And the checkers will start in a specific arrangement on those points as shown in the rule book. But as you play, you'll find you'll have this setup memorized in no time so that it looks like this when you're done. These points are divided into four groups of six points each. The six, which includes the pair of two white colored checkers on a single point, is known as Brown's home board, or in this case, my home board. This is White's home board because it has a point with a pair of Brown's checkers. The two groups of six points on this side are known as Brown's outer board and White's outer board. So that means we have Brown's home board here, then Brown's outer board, White's outer board, and White's home board. Each player now collects two dice and a cup. If your set comes with just two dice total, the players can share them. If you also have a doubling cube like this, set it aside for your first game, but I'll explain how it works at the end of this video. And that's the setup. In backgammon, you and the other player will each be trying to be the first to remove all of your own pieces from the board. But you must do this in a very specific way. As the player controlling the brown checkers, I'll be trying to get all of them onto the points of my home board here. And when my pieces travel, they always move in one specific direction that you can imagine goes from this point of my opponent's home board all the way to the left, then up here, and over to my home board. So if I had a piece, let's say, on this point, and I was moving it four spaces, it would travel this way. One, two, then up here for three, and here for four. In the same way, when my opponent moves their pieces, they go in a direction that runs from the point here all the way to the left, then down and all the way over to the right into their home board. So our pieces each move in opposing directions. Mine travel like this, and my opponents travel like this. We'll see exactly how you get your checkers to move in a moment, but just know, once you get all of your pieces into your own home board area, you'll then be able to make moves that cause them to exit the board on this side, also known as bearing them off. This is known as Brown's bearing off side, and this is White's. So again, I want to move all of my pieces around the board into my home section, and then, and only then, can I start having them bear off, exiting the board on this side. The player who gets all of their pieces off the board first wins. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and then going back and forth. And to determine the first player, each person picks up and rolls one of their dice. The player with the highest result goes first, re-rolling any ties. And then they take their turn using the values shown on both dice. So here I won by rolling a three and will use it along with my opponents too. On your turn, pick either of the dice and move any one of your checkers that number of points in the direction your pieces are allowed to move, which for brown pieces, as we learned, is the direction going from this point all the way around to this one. Let's start with a die showing a three and pick this point. You can always move any one checker from a point you've selected and going three spaces would send it one, two, three spaces to here. Now we use the other die, and again, we move any one of our checkers this number of spaces. We could even pick the checker that we just moved with the first die. But let's move one of these instead. And just keep in mind, when moving, you don't count this raised section known as the bar. So moving two spaces, we would go one, two. Also note, you can have any number of your pieces on the same point, so feel free to stack them if necessary to make room. The only point you can't enter with a move is one that contains two or more of your opponent's pieces. That's known as a blocked space. So if it was later in the game and we had a situation like this, 
I couldn't use this three value to move one of these pieces because that would put it one, two, three spaces into this blocked point. I also couldn't use a five to move one of them either because that would also put it one, two, three, four, five spaces into this blocked point. Also remember, you can't move your pieces off the board until they're all in your home board area. So we couldn't use this three or five on this piece because that would take it off the board, which isn't allowed yet. Sometimes you'll roll a value and not have any legal places to move any of your pieces with it. If so, you just ignore that die. I should also point out earlier, I said you could use both dice rolled on the same piece if you want but each move must still be performed separately. For example, if I had a two and a three and wanted to move a piece in this position, I can't treat this as a five and then move directly to here. I have to resolve each die separately. So if I moved with the two first, I'd be one, two, and blocked. So I couldn't pick this piece. I also couldn't use the three to move it because again, one, two, three would also be moving on to a blocked point. I'd need to find another one of my pieces to move with these values. If you ever roll the same value on both dice, you've rolled what is known as a double and something special happens. You treat them as if you had actually rolled four copies of that value. So in this case, you now have four threes to use on your turn. And again, with each value you resolve, you can either move a different checker each time or one or more that you'd moved previously that turn. Rolling doubles in backgammon is awesome. Possibly even more awesome is moving one of your pieces onto a point that only has one of your opponent's pieces. Remember, we said that if a space has two or more of your opponent's pieces, it's blocked and you can't go there. However, if your opponent only has one piece there, you can go to that space. In backgammon, a point with only one piece is commonly referred to as a blot. So for example, we could use this four to move one of these pieces, one, two, three, four spaces onto this blot. When you enter a space with only one of your opponent's pieces, that checker is said to be hit and is then moved to this center bar. As we'll see later, hitting your opponent's pieces is good. But otherwise, that's how you resolve your turn. You use the values on two dice to move two times, unless you got doubles, and then you get to move four times. And in situations where you don't have a legal move to make with a die, you just ignore it. Once you're finished resolving the dice that you can, you indicate the end of your turn by picking your dice up, and then the next player goes, rolling their two dice and using the values to move their checkers. Remember we said if one of your pieces is hit, it is sent to the bar. If you start your turn with any of your own pieces on the bar, then you must get them off before moving any of your other pieces. A piece that is leaving the bar must enter one of the points in their opponent's home board. So count the points in that section, starting with the one closest to the edge of the board, as one, and then continue. Two, three, four, five, six. The value shown on a die you've rolled is the numbered space you can move directly to. So if I use this three, it would allow me to move my piece on the bar directly to point number three. However, if a space is blocked, you can't move a piece there from the bar. So for example, I could not have used this six because the six space is currently blocked. I would have to use the three as I showed previously. As soon as all of your pieces are off the bar, any dice you have remaining can then be used as usual to move any of the other pieces that you have. Let's say we had a situation like this and it's my opponent's piece that is on the bar. They will need to enter my home board area. And again, these would be numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. They've rolled a one and a six, but both of those points are blocked. This means they can't do anything. In a case like that, the player is said to be dancing. They're stuck and won't be able to do anything else that turn. So it immediately goes back to their opponent's turn. This can really hurt if a player has a piece on the bar and then rolls doubles, but that one space rolled ends up being blocked by their opponent's pieces. Remember, rolling a double is like having four of the same value to use that turn. In this case, four fives. But the five point of this home board is blocked, so this piece can't leave the bar, and that means none of the fives rolled can be used. There's no limit to how many pieces can end up on the bar, so you'll want to carefully plan your moves to prevent your own pieces from being hit. 
Anytime you can use your dice to move and create blocked spaces rather than leave pieces vulnerable on their own is always a good idea. But if you roll the dice and there is a legal move to make, you must make it, even if it puts one of your pieces in a vulnerable position. You can't choose to ignore dice that you've rolled. You also can't use one of your numbers in such a way that it makes it impossible to use the other number if there would have been a way that you could use both. For example, let's say my opponent was taking their turn and they had rolled a six and a four. If they used the six to move this piece, it would end up one, two, three, four, five, six spaces away on this point. But now, they don't have a legal move anywhere that would allow them to use the four because every piece they could choose to move would be blocked. So this move isn't allowed because if they used the six to instead move this piece first, one, two, three, four, five, six, they would then still be able to use the four on this piece going one, two, three, four. Again, you must always resolve the dice so that you use as many of the results rolled as possible. However, if you roll and only one checker could be legally moved by your results, then you must use the highest value that you have to pick from, if either of them could end up being the only die that you can legally use. For example, in a case like this, if white rolled a six and a four, They'd love to use the four to move this piece to go one, two, three, four spaces to here, causing a hit on my piece. But then they'd have no way to use the six that they rolled since every six move is now blocked. However, if we reset this piece, we can see that they could have used the six to go one, two, three, four, five, six spaces. Now they can't use the four, but as the rules state, if you have only one possible move, you must use the higher value if possible. Remember, the object of the game is to get all of your checkers off the board before your opponent does, but you can only do this once all of your checkers are in your own home board. So right now, I can't remove any of my checkers because there's still some that aren't in my home board area. But once I use a die to get all of them in here, any future die value I use, including on the same turn, can now be used to bear off. This is a term to describe removing your checkers from the board. To understand bearing off, imagine the points of your home board being numbered from one to six, with the one being closest to the edge of the board. When it's time to bear off, you may use a die to remove one of your checkers from the board, which is sitting on the matching numbered point. For example, with this four, I could remove this piece, whereas a six would remove a piece from this point. You can also use a value to simply move a checker closer to this bearing off side. For example, if I had rolled a three, instead of bearing off one of these pieces, I might just move one of these pieces one, two, three spaces forward. If a die value is for a point that doesn't have one of your checkers on it, you must use it to move a checker on a higher numbered point if possible. So let's say I had just rolled a four. I don't have a checker on that point to bear off, so instead I'd need to move a checker from either of these two points four spaces forward. For example, I could move this one to here. If you need to resolve a value and don't have a checker on that point or a higher point within your home board, you get to bear off a piece from your highest point that still has a checker. So if our home board area looked like this and we were resolving this four, we don't have anything on the four space or higher, so you get to remove a piece taken from the highest point where you still have pieces. Then when we resolve the six, it'd be the same type of situation, so we'd take another piece from here. Let's say we had a situation like this, where our pieces are all in our home area and we've started bearing them off, but my opponent still has one of their pieces here as well. It's possible on their turn that they'll end up hitting one of my checkers, which will send it to the bar. Now I must get this checker off of the bar as normal before I can move any other piece. Not only that, I no longer can bear pieces off until I get this piece all the way back around to my home board area. Just to test all our knowledge, let's look at a situation like this where the brown player has been bearing off their pieces and they've just rolled a six and a four. They might want to bear off this piece with the six, but they can't because then they'd be left with a four that they can't use, and you have to use both dice if possible. You see, it isn't possible to use this four, for example, to bear off this piece, 
because you can't use a die value to bear off a point that is lower than the value if all the pieces above that value haven't been borne off yet. And we also can't use the four on the checkers of this point because moving four spaces would go one, two, three, four onto this blocked space. So instead, we have to go back and use the four on this piece, moving it one, two, three, four spaces. And then we could use the six to bear off the piece here. And those are all of the rules for moving and removing pieces from the board. And turns will go back and forth until a player has removed all their pieces from play, winning them the game. Being the first to remove all of your pieces earns you one point. However, if you get all of your pieces off the board before your opponent has removed any of theirs, that's an even better achievement known as a gammon, and you score two points for that game. On the other hand, if you get all of your pieces off the board and at least one of your opponent's pieces is still in your home board or on the bar, you've won a backgammon which is worth three points. You'll often play a number of matches until someone's total score is an amount that you've decided on beforehand. For example, playing until someone has scored a total of 11 points. But with that understood, we can now introduce an optional element, though some would say it's an essential one, the doubling cube. This is a die that has six sides showing a two, a four, an eight, a 16, a 32, and a 64. At the start of the game, leave it on the 64 side, placed somewhere between the two players. Although this shows a 64, you can think of this as having no real value yet. However, on a player's turn, before and only before they roll the dice, they can first pick up the cube and offer it to their opponent, turning it to the side that shows a two. The opponent now has two options, either accept or drop the cube. Let's explain accepting the cube first. To do this, they take the cube and set it beside themselves with the two value face up. Now when the game ends, the winner, no matter who it is, will multiply their score by the value on the doubling cube, in this case, two. So remember, normally, if you get all of your pieces off the board first, you score one point. But now you would multiply that by the value on the doubling cube. So two times one scores you two points. Remember, though, if you get all of your pieces off the board before the other opponent removes any of theirs, that scores you two points. But in this case, that would be two times two, or four points. It doesn't matter who has the doubling cube. Now, if either player wins, that winner will multiply their score by the value it shows. So passing the cube is a way of saying, I'm so confident I'll win, I'm willing to double the final score. If you thought you were gonna lose, you wouldn't pass the doubling cube to your opponent. That said, once a player has it, they may decide to pass it back. Once a player has been passed the cube during the game, they, and only they, can pass it again later. And again, they can only pass the cube at the start of one of their turns before rolling the dice. And when passed, the die is rotated to the next highest value. So if my opponent passed the doubling cube back to me, they would rotate it from two over to four. Now the winner will multiply the points they earn from this game by four. If I decide to pass the die back later, the score will be multiplied by eight, and so on. Back and forth it goes, increasing each time, as often as the players choose to pass it back and forth. As you can see, suddenly a single game can be worth a lot of points, and although the cube only goes to 64, there's really no limit to how much you can double. If it was already at 64, you could still pass the die, but you would treat this as if the multiplier was 128, though I've never played a game where that's happened. But remember, I said when the die is passed, you have two options. You can either accept the cube, which we've talked about, or you can reject it. This is also known as dropping the cube, and you might do this when you don't feel confident that you can win the game. When you drop the cube, the game immediately ends and whatever value is being passed to you is now halved and that becomes the final score your opponent immediately earns for that game. So if the cube was already at two and my opponent passed it to me, they would first rotate it to four. And if I decided to reject the cube, my opponent would cut this value in half and score two points total for this game. Just remember, once you've been past the cube, you control it. Only you can pass it back to your opponent to increase its value. Also remember, no matter who passed the cube, the winner of the game is the one who will gain its benefits. 
And with that, let's just end on a couple of notes about etiquette when playing backgammon. Your turn is considered over once you've picked up your own dice and put them back in your cup. In other words, you roll your dice, use their values, and when done, you signal your turn is over by dropping your dice back into your cup. If your opponent rolls their dice before this happens, their roll is not counted, and they must wait until after you've finished your turn, and then they can roll their dice. Until you pick up your dice, you can still move, but then change your mind about the moves you've made, resetting your checkers and trying something else. For example, the white player here having rolled a six and a two might move this piece six spaces, then think better of it and put it back, and decide to move this piece six spaces instead. Also make sure you roll the dice from a reasonable height so they're properly randomized. Using a cup and shaking it at least a few times is the best way to ensure a fair roll. Tradition also suggests players rolling the dice onto the home side of their board like this. But if either of the dice lands on a checker outside of the board or is leaning against the edge of the board, it is not considered a valid roll and you will have to re-roll both of the dice even if only one of them was invalid. Personally, I think it makes more sense to just roll on a flat surface beside the board. But some players may be more particular about this. And as with any game that's been around for 5,000 years, you may encounter slightly different rules or etiquette used by different players in different places. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play backgammon. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.